So they're going to introduce you. And then you're gonna Hi, everybody. Welcome. Sorry that we're a minute or two late, um, but we're very excited to be here with you today. My name is Lisa Lunghofer. I'm the executive director of the Gray Muzzle Organization, and we are thrilled to be joined by um, Dr. Jim Cook, who is going to be talking about neurology issues in, in senior dogs. So before I introduce, introduce Dr. Cook, I just wanted to encourage everybody to get your questions ready. Um, if you're joining us on Zoom, you can enter them in the Q&A box. And if you are joining us on Facebook Live, just enter your question in the comments um, field and, and we'll try to take as many questions as we can. All right, so I am pleased to um, introduce Dr. Cook, who is a highly regarded neurologist and neurosurgeon with more than 40 years of experience in the field. He received his PhD in neurophysiology from the University of Georgia after earning his DVM from The Ohio State University. A board certified neurologist for more than 35 years, he has a special interest in spinal surgery and MRI interpretation. Today, he is not only a well-respected neurologist and neurosurgeon, but also a sought-after thought leader. Dr. Cook has authored and co-authored more than 30 veterinary and human journal articles, textbook chapters, and research abstracts in some of the world's most well-respected industry publications. He currently practices at specialists in companion animal neurology in Clearwater, Florida, where he works in partnership with his patient's primary care veterinarian, to diagnose and treat dogs and cats with neurological disease. So with that, welcome Dr. Cook. I will turn the virtual floor over to you. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining in. The original topic that was requested was about cognitive dysfunction, and then was decided that it would be spread out to a little broader um, list of subjects. So it's going to be pretty informal and uh, maybe not as specific, but in order to be specific about any of these things would be multiple seminars. So what I hope to do is give you some basis for stimulating questions. Uh, I'll try to stick pretty much to the time frame as allotted, but if I shorten it up a little bit, it gives us more time for questions toward the end. And as our patients get older, just like in humans where they say 90% of our medical care comes in the last 10% of our lives, that's pretty similar with our pet patients and neurologic disease is no different decided to break this into three categories, uh, looking at mentation or um, intellectual level and seizures, balance and equilibrium, and locomotion. Because the original request was for cognitive dysfunction, I'll probably spend a little bit more time on the mentation and seizure aspect of this and let everybody get their questions ready to uh, go through at the end. Okay. Cognitive dysfunction is something that's been a, it's a relatively new disease. When I started into neurology, nobody had ever heard the term cognitive dysfunction. And it's sometimes referred to as canine dementia or senility. The patients have a variety of symptoms. They may sleep more. They don't recognize their owners. They don't want affection anymore. They're confused in their home environment or don't recognize their owners. Undesirable behaviors like barking at night, having accidents indoors, and just disoriented wandering. <clears throat> now in human medicine, dementia is a lot more clearly defined than in veterinary medicine. We don't have the large volume, large database of microscopic pathology data that 
is available in human medicine. In the dogs who have had autopsies and their brains evaluated under the microscope, there are some similarities between canine cognitive dysfunction and Alzheimer's disease in that there's a, an abnormal compound called beta amyloid, which is present in increased amounts. Now in human medicine, all Alzheimer's is dementia, but not all dementia is Alzheimer's. There's vascular dementia, there's Lewy body dementia, uh, which is one of the worst ones as we all know Robin Williams, when he found out he had it promptly committed suicide because of the severity and devastating effects of that. In veterinary medicine, cognitive dysfunction is considered a diagnosis of exclusion. If there's nothing else going on and the dog is acting inappropriately, then it's probably cognitive dysfunction. There are some MRI changes that are starting to be described as possibly connected to cognitive dysfunction in dogs. Now, this is a young dog, not excuse me, an older dog who owners complained that there were some issues going on with behavior. This is a relatively normal looking brain. The things that a radiologist looks at, and I don't know if you folks can see my cursor moving here, but there's a round structure right here in the middle of the brain called the interthalamic adhesion. It's typically pretty close to round and it has predictable dimensions. In older dogs, that structure is often less than round and smaller than usual. We also see the gyri and sulci of the brain, which are the folds and uh, tissue uh, in between them get bigger, meaning that there's been brain atrophy. Now, these are very subtle changes and requires usually a radiologist with measuring equipment, reviewing the exam to say, oh, there's brain atrophy because the, the gyri are smaller, the sulci are wider, and in this case too, that interthalamic adhesion is smaller than it should be. In veterinary medicine, cognitive dysfunction is not the jurisdiction of one specialty. Neurologists see a lot of it because the patient is behaving abnormally. Behaviorists also see a lot of it because the dog is behaving abnormally. Behaviorists believe that cognitive dysfunction is underdiagnosed. As neurologists, we tend to think that it's maybe overdiagnosed. As we talked about before, all the things that the pet does that is, are not typical anymore. They have accidents indoors, they wander, they don't recognize their owners, etc. Okay, and a dog with a brain like this, we would assume that it's probably cognitive dysfunction. Here's another patient who had all those same symptoms. But in this case, we can see that right in the center of the brain is a very large contrast enhancing mass. This is a tumor that has arisen from the pituitary area and is taking up a truly surprising amount of space inside the patient's brain, and yet the only symptoms that they've shown are the same things that are seen in a cognitive dysfunction patient. So that's why neurologists think that the disease is possibly overdiagnosed, because there's probably a fair number of pets out there running around who have a lesion like this, and they've just been written 
as cognitive dysfunction rather than uh, being investigated for having structural or inflammatory brain disease. This brings us to what other things might we see that might tell us it's not cognitive dysfunction. And one of those big things is seizure activity. Now, cognitive dysfunction aside, any dog over the age of five who starts spontaneously having seizures has a 65 to 70% chance of having structural or inflammatory brain disease. Now, dogs who have been diagnosed at a younger age as having idiopathic epilepsy appear to also be at risk for losing some of their cognitive function as time goes on as a result of seizures and or the combined effect of seizures and anti-epilepsy drugs. There haven't been large studies to document what the connection is, but we do know that some dogs who have idiopathic epilepsy do start losing their focus a little bit sooner than others. While preparing for this, I found an excellent review article online that uh, you may want to refer to to get some more information. And it's written by a certified behaviorist, a Dr. Lynn Siebert. And I thought it was an excellent article. And it's called, it, the specific name is Management of Dogs and Cats with Cognitive Dysfunction. If you put that in your search engine, it should pop right up and it goes through a lot more detail than what we can do in an hour discussion here. So, the primary treatment that's been offered for cognitive dysfunction is a drug called selegiline, which is marketed as various compounds, uh, Anapril and others. And the theory is that it stimulates production of catecholamines, which act as neurotransmitters to improve brain function. There have been studies that show that it does improve dogs, but it has to be given for at least a month before benefits are seen. I've used it. Uh, I wasn't that impressed with it, but other people have said that it does work. So in a situation like this, we will never deny that patient the opportunity to be treated. And there are a few other drugs that are recommended as supportive drugs for treatment of cognitive dysfunction. And if you care to look up that article and read through it, you'll find a, uh, other things that are discussed in detail. But if you have a patient who is elderly, has never had a history of seizures, they're losing their focus and getting a little fuzzy around the edges and then seizures come into it, strongly consider the possibility that we're actually dealing with a primary structural or inflammatory brain disease as opposed to cognitive dysfunction. So, so we'll, I think that covered most of the points I wanted to get across about cognitive dysfunction, mentation. Uh, hopefully it'll generate some questions at the end. And we'll move on to balance and equilibrium, which are things that are certainly important and often deficient in our aging dogs. Uh, I wanted to put some videos in here and I was informed that putting in videos not only uh, becomes very problematic, but it uh, ends up messing with the ability to deliver the, the uh, seminar and the webinar. So we're just going to talk about these briefly. I mean, overall, as patients age, they develop a lot of things. Uh, 
that can affect their balance and equilibrium. The, as the bones and joints get less flexible, it's harder for dogs to correct issues with position sense in space. Um, their ability to detect changes in position uh, from their vestibular system or balance system can be reduced. As their vision decreases, that also can affect their coordination. Now, one of the big things that we see constantly in older dogs is an acute attack of vertigo or loss of vestibular function. It used to be called old dog vestibular disease or geriatric vestibular syndrome, and it is most prevalent in older dogs. But it can be seen in much younger dogs. And in fact, it is also seen fairly commonly in cats. Uh, when I was in veterinary school a long time ago, it was a feline disease. It was never discussed as affecting dogs. Nowadays, when I mention that it's a feline disease as well, my younger colleagues look at me like, are, are you sure we've never heard of this? In fact, um, my own cat, one year I was in California at the annual convention for neurologists, and my wife called me from Florida and said that our old tomcat was laying in the driveway with his head tilted and his eyes twitching. And every time he tried to get up, he fell over to the left side and rolled over. So he was a tough old bird. I told her to offer him a treat. He ate it. I said, fine, put him in a box in the garage, make sure he gets fed. And by the time I got back, he was demanding to go outside and catch lizards again. This is a common thing we see in older dogs. Now, it can have multiple causes. If the patient has a history of bad ear infections, it's probably an infection which has spread down from the outer ear down into the middle and inner ears and is affecting the balance centers. And the reason these dogs look so badly affected, their heads twist 90 degrees, they fall over constantly in one direction and may roll until they come up against the wall. Their eyes will twitch wildly uh, because what's happened is you've got normal balance input coming from one side of the body and virtually none coming from the other. The brain does not know what to do with this. And so the patient ends up as, as we've just described. Now, there are other parts of the balance system that are not in the ear that are in the brain. And there can be a lot of overlap between the way the two of them look. And in fact, in an acute case, the signs can be so severe that even an experienced neurologist can look at the dog and the patient's signs are so um, overwhelming to the patient that we may, may not be able to tell you just by looking at them, is this an ear problem or is this a brain problem? Now, there are certain things that will show up in a brain problem per se, that cannot happen when they have a middle ear disease. But those don't have to be present. So it can be difficult to tell the two apart. The nice thing about the old dog or geriatric vestibular syndrome is that with time and supportive care, treatment of any infections that might be present, these patients will usually compensate and get back on their feet. Depends to some extent what their other body systems are like. If the patient is badly arthritic and mostly blind already from age, they're gonna have a lot more difficulty compensating. And I say compensation because one of the things that I get called on to comment on to clients from the local vets is why does the dog still have a head tilt? Why is the head still tipped anywhere from 30 to 75 degrees to that side? And the reason is 
the structures that are involved in picking up balance information are incredibly delicate. Once they're damaged, they're probably not recovering. What's happening is that this patient over time, their brain is adapting to keeping the dog upright by processing 100% of normal balance information from one side and figuring out how to coordinate that with maybe 50% or less of normal balance information from the other side. So what happens is you end up with patients whose head is tilted long-term or sometimes even permanently. And another thing that will tell you that this is compensation rather than recovery is if you run in and grab that dog and pick it up rapidly and disturb its orientation in space, they will promptly go back into that twisted rolling posture. And then it takes them a couple minutes to kind of get calmed down and get back on their feet. Other things that potentially can cause this is if the dog whacks their head just right, they can actually cause bleeding into the middle ear around these balance centers. Now that's not common. Most of our old dogs are in the house where they can't get into that kind of trouble, but if they run out and get bumped by a car, certainly they can have acute vestibular disease from that. And we do in rare occasions see tumors arise in the middle and inner ear in dogs and cats. They can also have tumors or infections arise in the nervous system surrounding the nerves and the centers for balance and equilibrium. That's why we always offer in a situation like this for the patient to have an MRI and a spinal fluid if it appears that there might be more than just an ear infection going on. And then the treatment would be as appropriate for whatever the condition is. But uh, this is often inappropriately referred to as a stroke. I know that if I didn't have a medical education and my dog was doing this and somebody said, your patient is having an acute idiopathic peripheral vestibular event, my eyes would start to twitch and I'd probably get a head tilt too. Um, it's easier sometimes in that situation for a veterinarian to say, well, it's a stroke and since most of the dogs get better, that's a, you know, it's okay, you can call it whatever you want as long as the patient gets better. <clears throat> True strokes rarely cause this kind of balance and equilibrium issue. It's possible, but uh, in the long run, we're usually not dealing with that. So. Okay. And the last thing we're going to touch on will be locomotion. How well do these patients get around? How do they move? And some of the things that are sometimes misrepresented or improperly interpreted to um, account for locomotion difficulties. Okay, apparently this is not quite as, it looked lighter than this when we set it up. But this patient was having a walking problem. And there's a little bump down here between these two vertebrae it's called spondylosis. Now, 40 years ago, before we had access to MRIs for dogs, veterinarians as a group would look at this and say, well, that, that must be the problem. In point of fact, virtually all dogs as they get older have some degree of spondylosis, if not at this location, at multiple locations running up their spine. In this case, we can see that there's a nice normal spinal cord and spinal fluid compartment running right over the top of that and it's been shown pretty definitively that spondylosis has nothing to do with disc herniations or with spinal cord disease. So we use that to go in and try to determine then, does our patient with locomotor problems, does it have orthopedic disease or does it have neurologic disease? 
Now the patient with orthopedic disease, and heaven knows that as our patients get older, they get arthritis, they get ligament damage, they get hip dysplasia, various things that begin to interfere with their ability to move. What we try to look for, the patient with orthopedic disease typically can walk pretty well, but their legs tend to move in shorter strides. The movements are coordinated. They go in a, a normal straight line front to back movement, but they just don't take as long as steps as they can. This may be due to restriction from joint damage, or it may be due to discomfort from trying to move joints that have some degree of arthritic change. A lot of times these patients will actually, they'll scuff their feet. They'll won't pick their feet up very well. And as they move, they'll actually slide the feet on the floor, but they'll keep the bottom surface of the foot on the floor where it belongs. You don't see them dragging their toes or scraping their nails as they walk. In cases where there is a leg that has pain from joint disease or an orthopedic problem, if it's a single limb affected, they will tend to lift that leg up and not bear weight on it. In fact, we've seen dogs who had bilateral injuries to their knee joints in the back legs. They actually learn to lift their pelvis up in the air and walk on their front feet so that they don't have to put weight on those painful back legs. When we look at a patient who has neurologic disease, what we tend to see is that there tends to be a wide base stance. The legs are spread apart to try to help maintain balance. Depending on what part of the nervous system is involved, they will tend to actually drag the toes and scrape the skin and toenails across the top of the foot. Sometimes just the front, sometimes just the back, depending on where the problem is. Sometimes it's just on one side. But there is a reduction in the patient's ability to tell where that foot is and to move it properly so they drag them. Sometimes the only thing you may hear initially is you just hear the nails clicking on the concrete or on the sidewalk as they move along. As it progresses, these patients will actually stand with their feet knuckled over, and it's probably something you will see a veterinarian do to test whether or not that patient can tell where the feet are and put them back. Standing with the feet knuckled is rarely seen with orthopedic disease. There are some occasions when you might, but as a general rule, standing with their feet knuckled over and that much dragging of the toes, that's going to be neurologic rather than orthopedic. The other thing is they walk and they have this wide base stance. They have clumsy and uncoordinated limb movements to the point where they'll swing one leg all the way across and trip the other leg as they're trying to walk. Now, this can get complicated because as our patients get older, what happens? They'll get both. They may have chronic low grade damage to their knee joints or to their hips, and then they're also developing issues that interfere with their brain and spinal cord function then it becomes a challenge to determine which one we're dealing with. And most of the time we can sort out by looking for the wide base stance, tendency to drag the toes or stand knuckled. It's still important to determine what the patient's orthopedic status is. The reason being, we have an older dog who's very arthritic and develops a problem like a disc herniation, which presses on the spinal cord, interferes with their walking movements. We take a lot of these dogs to surgery. 
we fix them up and they regain function. If your spinal cord's not working and you have a solid musculoskeletal base underneath the patient to support them, they're probably going to recover in a relatively uncomplicated fashion. If your spinal cord's normal and you have a major orthopedic problem like a ruptured ligament interfering with limb use or a bad arthritis that needs to be treated, again, that patient will probably be able to manage okay and respond to treatment or surgery for an orthopedic problem. Unfortunately, as these guys get older, if they have both, if your orthopedic foundation is bad and you develop a spinal cord issue, this is going to lead to fairly prolonged and sometimes incomplete recovery from spinal disease. And by the same token, if you have a chronic spinal cord injury that's never been treated um, and the patient needs an orthopedic surgery, they're going to have a pretty prolonged and again, possibly incomplete recovery. And This is a discussion that we have to often have with our owners of pets with both situations. Occasionally, we end up having to fix both at the same time. And again, that's we're talking longer recoveries, uh, more chance of incomplete recovery. And sometimes it has to be a quality of life decision on the part of the pet owner is can we improve that pet's quality of life by going through all of these surgeries or other aggressive treatments at the same time? Um, it's a crystal ball I wish they'd given out in vet school because it's a decision we have to make almost daily. And you always wonder, is what I can do, what I should do, and how am I going to, how am I really helping this patient, which is always our main goal, to try to preserve good quality life, keep a long-term beloved pet as part of the family in good spirits and good health, and help make the decision. If we can't, we have to objectively say to the owner, are we sure that we're headed in the right direction for this kid. And I've moved ahead fairly quickly. Um, I had to put this picture in. I'm a pug lover for many years, and this is, <clears throat> this is not my pug. This pug is Riley, who belongs to one of my technicians. Totally deaf, but he's adapted beautifully. For some reason, his original owners decided they, they weren't interested in having him anymore. And one of my technicians adopted him and he has been hitting the lottery for the last two years. And he comes in and spends a couple days a week sitting in Poppy Doc's lap and enjoying life. So I think, um, we can probably stop here and then have a prolonged question and answer session. Uh, I have a wonderful ability to screw up electronic stuff, so I'm going to uh, rely on my, my moderators to help me get through to the questions and start uh, answering specific questions. Absolutely. Dr. Cook, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, Lisa, I don't know if you have Facebook questions. I do have a couple here in the Q&A box and the chat box. So you want me to shoot or did yeah. you have one? Okay. So the first question we had, and Dr. Cook, this was after you talked about um, the canine cognitive dysfunction piece, but Kathy wanted to know if there were any preventative measures like nutrace nutraceuticals. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. <laughs> nope, you said it just fine. Okay. <laughs> There's no definitive data about that. There are some diets out. Um, there's um, 
I don't know if I'm allowed to say brand names in, uh, in this webinar. No, I'm not, but um, ketogenic diets and diets that are high in medium chain triglycerides, that she might accomplish the same thing by throwing uh, coconut oil in the dog's food daily, um, have been shown to support brain function. In terms of specific nutraceuticals for prevention, I don't think anything's been done with that. It would be a it would be a pretty complex and pretty long-term project because you'd have to take a lot of dogs and have a group on the different products and then follow them for years and determine whether or not they had developed cognitive dysfunction afterwards. So it could be done, but uh, it hasn't been, and it's, it, would be, it would be a challenging project to say the least. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, Christy asked, she said that her dog is a 14 year old Beagle Basset mix and had a vestibular event in January. It was horrible. So she's asking, what's the chance that it will happen again? And is it guaranteed it'll happen again? Okay, these acute and apparently idiopathic attacks, because even the, even the ones where we do not find an apparent cause probably do have some degree of inflammatory disease down in their middle and inner ear. In a majority of cases in dogs, it's one and done. They can have repeat attacks, but it's not the norm. Now in people, repeat attacks are the norm. But in dogs, most of the time, once they've had it, we don't worry about it too much happening again. Now, if the dog's had a history of chronic recurrent infection, then all bets are off because if the infection comes back, then the signs are gonna come back. But the more idiopathic forms where we cannot determine a cause, it's not, again, it's not the norm for them to have multiple events. Not impossible, but it's not typical. Okay, great. So another question is, if you had neuro issues in hind legs and an MRI showed no compression or lesions, but had protein in the CSF, what are the different things it could be? <laughs> okay. Um, protein elevation in spinal fluid is a relatively nonspecific response. And it can come from tumors, and assuming that the nervous system, that we've cleared the possibility of tumors with the MRI, um, chronic inflammatory disease, which if it were inflammatory, the cells should be abnormal, not just an elevated protein. Um, low levels of compression from chronic discs can elevate the protein. If the, there is an absence of all those things and you have an elevated protein, there's a pretty good chance then you're dealing with a degenerative disease of the spinal cord. The most common one we deal with is called degenerative myelopathy. It is related to ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease in people. And it does cause chronic low grade, excuse me, chronic prolonged deterioration in spinal cord function. There is testing available for this condition. Now there are others certainly, but this is the one we deal with the most. Uh, a valid DNA test has been developed for this condition. It's very sensitive. And if you have a patient you think needs tested for it, your veterinarian can direct you to the testing institution and actually get a home test kit so you can play CSI and harvest your own dog's DNA with a cheek scraper and then submit it to the lab. Uh, again, I'm, uh, I can't name names or companies, but uh, it is something that can be done. I guess one other thing that might elevate protein in the absence of anything else, but it would be an acute problem. There is a 
type of spinal cord stroke called fibrocartilaginous embolism. And these dogs develop acute spinal cord signs without any detectable evidence of swelling, pressure, discs, whatever. It is possible for those patients to also have some elevated protein in their spinal fluid, but it would typically have a set of symptoms and a history that would lead you to that conclusion anyway. Great, thank you. So we have a question um, from Jennifer here. So she's giving a little background about her dog. So she has a 13 year old male Boykin. Um, he poops without knowing um, he doesn't, and he's not standing still when he does it. It started in January. His hind end droops. Um, the vet did a did turn his feet to see if there was scuffing and found that there was slight scuffing. He was started on Rimadil. He still gets around well, up and down stairs, jumping in the bed, but doesn't run or run much anymore, but will walk. So um, she was just kind of wondering what she should be looking for as a next stage. She may choose to not move forward with an MRI, but she's not sure what to do. Okay. Um, wor worsening loss of walking ability is one sign to watch for. Starting to use, now is this a male Boykin, did you say? She said male, and then I'm sorry, she also added that he is a DM carrier not affected. The vast majority of DM carriers do not ever develop signs of the disease. Now that's not 100%. The, uh, the institution which is leading the world in research on that condition is soon going to release some statistics on how many carriers actually do start developing signs of the disease as well as some other factors about it. So that's probably unlikely to be part of the problem. There might be some degree of disc protrusion right where the lower lumbar spinal cord hooks into the sacrum, tickling nerve roots and interfering with his ability to know that he's pooping. There are dogs who develop a type of cyst in their spinal canal called an arachnoid cyst or an arachnoid diverticulum. It's a fluid pocket which expands very slowly and chronically over time. And for some reason, those dogs are reported to have frequently lose fecal continence before they lose walking ability. Generally, walking ability leaves before continence, but dogs who have an arachnoid diverticulum may start dropping uh, poop before they lose walking ability. Now that is a condition, it may be there, it may not, but the only way you can see that is either with MRI or with some other type of advanced imaging. Plain x-rays will not show it to you. Okay, great. So Terry, um, her, or let's see, the question is for her dog, as he ages with potential ortho issues, does it make sense to do further tests? So the background on her dog is that she, let's see, wanted to know if a CT scan would be helpful or MRI is better. She has a 65 pound Chesapeake Bay retriever mix and has had balance is issues since he was one and he's now 10. So the background on him is that he was loaded with pellets from being shot, but has been pretty healthy. Um, an eye specialist at one was thought to be the issue of his balance issues. Um, they said it was due to damage to the area of the brain that takes in visual images and makes the body react accordingly. So no other diagnostics have been done. So they were just kind of wanting to know, you know, what, what should they do? More testing or? Okay. Um, so it sounds like the balance issue in this case is probably brain related as opposed to spinal cord related. Uh, now, just to back up a little bit, Chesapeake Bay Retrievers are a very high risk breed for DM. <clears throat> it might be advisable to get the dog tested just to know what all else might be going on. In the case of a patient who's loaded down with pellets and there is a suspicion 
that some of those pellets may have altered brain function for vision. Um, it's certainly possible, depending on where those pellets are located, could one of them be causing some issues with balance. In this case, if there's metallic pellets in there, you would probably go for CT. MRI, even if the pellets are not magnetic, they won't be attracted to the magnet in an MRI, but it still creates a huge metal artifact, which interferes with the ability to see the structures you're trying to look at. Uh, you'll get some of that with a CT as well, probably not as much, but a, a lot of metal fragments in a situation like that interferes with your interpreting ability no matter what. Okay. Um, and then just a hello, Carol Pliska and Allie say hello. She said, it's oh. great to see you again. You know, <laughs> she may not believe this. I have been uh, thinking about Allie for the last week and just wondering how she was doing. And I, did, I didn't want to tempt fate and call her up and say, and find out something new was going on. Okay. <laughs> Well, maybe she'll tell us here. Okay, so we actually, we have 10 minutes left and we have a few more questions. Um, so Chris wanted to know in an older dog with seizures, what else can cause the seizures besides the inflammatory brain disease? Okay, well, tumors, certainly. Um, in, inflammation, we see a surprising amount of sterile encephalitis or immune mediated encephalitis in dogs. It's usually a younger dog disease, but I have diagnosed it in geriatric patients as old as 16. Um, there may be other structural conditions, um, small dogs who are predisposed to hydrocephalus. They may live for it with for years compensated and then they decompensate for whatever reason. Um, about 35% of older dogs who come in with seizures actually do have late onset epilepsy. Epilepsy being defined as recurrent seizures without detectable disease that's expected to cause seizures. There are many physiologic factors that determine whether or not a patient has the propensity for seizure activity and whether or not they will manifest it. A lot of these things change with age or with other body conditions. Um, I'll just throw out one quick example. Both canine and human females who have a seizure disorder during parts of the estrus cycle when estrogens are high, they will have a lot more seizures. But when they get pregnant, the estrogen goes down and progesterone goes up, their seizure incidence drops. And there's quite a few other things that go on in the body that can affect this likelihood. But human neurologists believe that about two thirds of the world's population has an area of their brain that could serve as a trigger or focus for seizure activity. So obviously all of us aren't running around taking phenobarbital or Keppra. The other part of that equation is the one, the strength of the focus, which can change over time. And two, what's called the threshold, which is the resistance of the surrounding brain to being taken over by the focus and allowing seizure activity to come out. Uh, a person or a dog who has a weak focus and a high threshold may go their entire life with no seizure, even though they have seizure potential. The individual with a strong focus and a low threshold is probably going to manifest those seizures. Okay. Oh, you know, one other thing before I forget, and veterinarians, myself included, have to remember this and be alert. Now, certain organ failures can help trigger seizure activity, but they're not usually until end stage. By the time liver failure, kidney failure gets to the point of causing seizures, you already know your dog is on its deathbed. But certain instances can cause a dog's blood sugar to drop rapidly. And if it goes low enough, fast enough, they'll have seizures from it. 
usually by the time you get somewhere to have the sugar, the blood sugar tested, it's bounced back up again. So, but anytime you have seizures that are hard to figure out, it always makes sense to make sure that they get a fasted blood glucose when they come to their vet at some point and follow through with that. It may take two or three rounds. I've had dogs that I had to test five times before I finally got a sugar low enough to uh, convince us to go ahead with a hypoglycemia workup as opposed to a primary brain workup. Okay, thank you. Um, so someone was interested in your comments on spondylosis. Um, spondylosis, they, yes. Okay, yeah, I, these questions are hard on me, you guys. I can't pronounce all these words. Hey. Half of a medical education is getting a vocabulary. That no one <laughs> um, so uh, let's see. They had a dog um, after his adoption. He ran with his back leg swinging like a pendulum. So he would propel himself by pitching onto his front legs. Mm -hmm. um, pooped like a horse while walking, never stopped, always in motion. And then toward the end of his life, an acupuncture vet requested a spinal x Ray, which revealed that he had the worst case he'd ever seen. Um, and so swimming therapy seemed to give some brief relief in his final days. So just a little bit more about that condition. Okay, well, spondylosis is actually a uh, new bone formation that bridges between vertebrae. And it's been shown pretty definitively that in the vast, vast majority of cases, this is all on the outside of the bones. This comes nowhere near the spinal cord. And it's just a, an incidental finding in most cases. I, I see older dogs who their entire vertebral column is a solid fused spondylosis, and yet they have no walking difficulties whatsoever. So it has to be interpreted in the light that whatever's going on, if the dog's not walking properly, the spondylosis typically just isn't part of the of it. Now it can cause pain. It can potentially cause some restriction in movement because the spinal cord is no longer flexible and supple. But in terms of causing actual paralysis, no, spondylosis alone just can't do it. It's not in the right place to do it. Okay, so we have about four minutes left and I wanna try, we have quite a few questions. I don't think we're gonna be able to answer all of them, but we will do our best. So Cynthia wanted to know, she has a dog with CD. She's her third dog to have this condition. Can you explain why dogs with CD seem almost compelled to constantly wedge themselves between pieces of furniture, behind large appliances, et cetera? Well, it's called head pressing. And in terms of the exact physiology, we, I can't really answer that, but we see it constantly as a symptom of brain, poor brain function. Uh, I think it's just, they get into that corner and they don't have the intellectual ability to figure out how to back up and get out of it. Okay. Um, so another quick question. We've said DM a lot. Can you explain what that is? Yeah. DM stands for degenerative myelopathy. Now, if you're talking to an internist, it's diabetes mellitus, but for a neurologist, it's degenerative myelopathy. It is a variant of ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. It causes gradual but slowly progressive loss of function of the spinal cord. There are many super high risk breeds. And as the testing has gotten more sensitive and the research labs have been going out to big dog shows and testing, we are finding more and more breeds do carry the trait. It is a recessive trait. It has to be, you have to get a bad gene from each parent. It's a late onset disease. So you don't know that the dog has it until usually they're seven or eight years old. We do now have a DNA test, which identifies those dogs who are carry normal or carriers or who actually have both copies of the bad gene. Um, there is currently no validated treatment. Um, 
people have to be careful what they read on the internet. I had someone show up the other day who said, you do stem cell therapy here and that will cure my dog. Well, stem cell therapy doesn't work for degenerative myelopathy, neither does anything else. And I've never done stem cell therapy in my life. So I'm not quite sure where on the internet they found their information, but currently there's no specific treatment and we just try to keep the dogs upright, moving as long as possible. Unfortunately, oftentimes they're big dogs. So um, supportive care can become problematic after a while. When they get to the point where they can't walk, it's tough. Okay, thank you. So we are at time. I don't know, do you, do you, can you take one more question? I just feel bad we started just a couple of minutes late. So I just wanna do one more. Okay, and this has got a, I'm, I have a few minutes if you want to try to squeeze in a couple more. Okay, Lisa, is that okay with you? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you so much. I have questions too on um, Facebook. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Um, um, this one was um, about seizures and flea prevention medicines. Um, oops, and it just disappeared, sorry. Why don't you go ahead, Abby? I am going to have to try to find it again. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Cook, for staying with us. So, okay, there's another word here. I'm not going to know how to pronounce. It's a drug. Okay. Uh, Rebecca wanted to know is seligaline? Seligaline, yes. Okay, seligaline. Only I'd... effective in dogs who have true cognitive dysfunction versus dogs who have symptoms of cognitive dysfunction due to yeah. structural changes in the brain. Yeah, well, there's a little bit of a problem with definition there because uh, we, we call cognitive dysfunction in dogs a process of elimination. If we can't find anything else, then it's probably cognitive dysfunction. Um, we don't typically do brain biopsies in dogs, and the information we get from their brains is typically post-mortem. So the selegiline is reported to be effective in dogs with cognitive dysfunction, although there's the possibility that cognitive dysfunction in dogs may not be one disease. It may be a combination of multiple factors that all end up causing the brain to not work properly. Right. So she said that her dog who recently passed away did not have a brain tumor, but he had slowly worsening hydrocephalus due to ah. caudal occipital malformation gotcha. and was not a surgical candidate due to having other degenerative issues. I would not have expected that dog to respond to selegiline. Okay. Okay. Lisa, did you find your question or you want me to keep going? Um, I think that, unfortunately, I can only see five questions at a time on Facebook Live, but I think the question that was about whether or not you had seen seizures in, re in response to um, flea prevention meds. Well, we see cases where we suspect that there is a fairly compelling time course that the patient gets a flea medication and then has seizures. If you read the package inserts on all of these broad spectrum parasiticides, virtually all of them have some kind of a warning about the possibility of neurologic reactions. The, the difficulty is there's no test that I can run that will tell you absolutely yes, this was from the flea med or absolutely no, it was not. Um, if somebody says every time they give it, the dog has a seizure, I think that's pretty pretty good circumstantial evidence that it's probably the drug and you probably shouldn't use it on this dog anymore. It's been suggested to our specialty that they put together a forum and come up with a consensus statement on what parasiticides should be considered as dangerous or maybe less safe in dogs with a history of neurologic disease. Uh, chances are by, by the time the, the forum came up with a consensus statement, there'd be so many new products on the market, they'd just have to start over again. But uh, it hasn't been done. 
we tell people it's trial and error. There, there are certain ones that are not recommended for dogs with seizures. And again, I'm, I'm not going to say brand names on the, on the webinar. Um, but there are some that should not be used in dogs with a history of seizure disease. And there are others that are probably safe, but you just have to try them and see what happens. Great, thank you. You have another one, Abby? I do, but if you, why don't we take some more from Facebook if there's more? Oh, no, it's okay, go ahead. Okay, um, so <clears throat> someone asked what role does physical therapy or rehab play in neuro problems? Uh, it's very important, particular dogs with severe spinal injuries, rehab gets them, helps get them back on their feet quite a bit faster. The longer they are down, the more chance they're going to develop serious complications like bed sores, urinary tract infections, etc. Good comprehensive physical therapy and rehab get these guys up and moving faster, and that's I think critical for uh, their best recovery chance. Great. Um. So lots of thank you messages just for you answering all these one-on-one -on -one questions. Um, Carol did send an update that unfortunately Allie uh, was diagnosed with bone cancer last fall and just passed away in March, but she was thought she had a remarkable full life thanks to you and your staff. And so just thank you for that. Lots of thank yous for answering these questions. Um, I don't know, do we wanna just take one more? I will take it. Okay, let's do one more. So um, someone wanted to know if a bleeding event from a hemangiosarcoma in a spleen could cause seizures, and if so, if that's common. Um, as a direct cause of seizures, probably not. But if the patient has any tendency towards seizures, the stress, the alteration in other body parameters like oxygenation of the brain, uh, maintaining blood pressure could certainly make them more likely to have one. Um, but is in terms of just the bleeding event from the spleen itself, probably not the primary cause of the seizure. Okay, great. I do keep in mind, none of my patients has ever read a textbook. So probably a lot of the things I've said don't happen, may have happened because the dog didn't bother to find out that he wasn't allowed to do that. But uh, for the most part, like we, like we discussed, so. Okay, thank you so much. No, oh, you are very welcome. I hope everybody got something from this and uh, answered as many questions as we could. Thank you so much, Dr. Cook. That was really, really helpful. And thank you to um, Abby. We met my colleague. I'm sorry I didn't introduce you at the beginning, Abby. Thank you for doing such a great job fielding all those questions and pronouncing all those medical terms. <laughs> And thank you so much for Dr. to you, Dr. Cook, for sharing your expertise. Um, really, judging by the number of questions and, and commitment, um, this is clearly an important topic, and perhaps we can do another session um, on Absolutely. something related. Absolutely. Okay. Terrific. Well, we really appreciate you sharing your time and your your passion for this topic and, and your expertise in the area. So thank you, and thanks to everyone who joined us today. Um, we will have this webinar available, um, uh, recorded, a recording of it. So if you registered, you'll get that automatically, and it will also be available on our YouTube page. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Hey, bye. All right. Bye.